the upcoming Champions League final featuring Real Madrid and Borussia Dortmund. The teams that before the season synchronously lost its best players for various reasons revived in memory a strange but meaningful tendency which was dominant throughout the 1990s and the 2000s. Back then, the clubs who just sold their key footballers or were deprived of them due to the certain hostile circumstances, regularly won the European Cup right after it. Over the period from 1988 to 2010, there were nine those cases, plus the other three, when the time gap between the loss of leading player and the continental triumph was slightly longer, two full seasons. It would be fair to count or at least recall them too, given the context. For instance, when in 2019 Chelsea were forced to sold Eden Azar, who pushed through his transfer to Real Madrid, very few could suggest that the Blues will win the Champions League in the relatively near future. It worth adding that back at the time the club of Roman Abramovich has been suffering from a transfer ban levied by FIFA, so in reality, in a fully competitive mode, the way to success took just one season. On the other hand, in 1993, Ajax, who smoothly replaced the seemingly indispensable Dennis Bergkamp with Jari Littmanen, simply had no chance to win the Champions League straight away, given the fact that the Amsterdam-based club was playing in the other tournament, the Cup Winners' Cup. With the flying fin on the pitch, Ajax in 1994 won the Dutch League and the following year conquered Europe. As for Manchester United, the team of Alex Ferguson in a very positive manner reacted to the decision of Eric Cantona when the mercurial Frenchman in 1997 suddenly ended his illustrious career. The English club performed so brilliantly in the first half of the season that topped almost all imaginable bookmakers' charts. But in 1998, Mew fell victim to the lack of depth. With only 14-15 footballers in active rotation, the team just ran out of gas by the early March. With the addition of Yap Stam, Dwight York and Jesper Blomqvist, and the return of Roy Keane, who missed basically the whole 1997-1998 campaign due to severe injury, Ferguson promptly fixed this problem and in 1999 reached the summit of sport. Whatever paradoxical and odd this tendency may sound, it has some rationalist behind it for sure. Indeed, it's tough and unpleasant to lose your best player. But the truth is that a year in football of high level is a long time, almost eternity, in order to react and bounce back. Moreover, almost all the top clubs have not only resources to buy someone instead, but also a solid structure of play, which helps a lot in those cases. For example, Paisley and Red Star Belgrade were very much on the way up and didn't lose momentum, even selling Ruth Gullet and Dragon Stojkovic respectively. On the contrary, the void created by the disappearance of the key footballer motivated the rest to evolve more quickly. That said, it would be fair to notice that the role of one individual in this sport is overhyped. Even in the classic case of Diego Maradona and Argentina national team in 1986, the claim that one player single-handedly, or rather single-allegedly, won the tournament is white of the mark, to put it mildly. For sure, without Maradona, his teammates would have been unable to reach the pinnacle, but at the same time, even Diego Armando himself could have not demonstrated the sheer brilliance without active help from the part of his comrades, who tirelessly ran and defended as a unit, not to mention the fact that the team was carefully building around Maradona for two years and perfectly met all his requirements and characteristics. Obviously, the inimitable Argentine 
was absolutely irreplaceable, regardless of the tactics. But it's much easier to overcome the absence of those leading players who are one step or two behind him. Here, the well-oiled system of play and all developments could be a major asset. Speaking of Ajax and Litmanin, it should be stressed that the Finn was inserted in the familiar coordinate system, which helped him a lot to blossom. As a result, he turned from the rarely used footballer into one of the best in Europe over the course of a few weeks. Meanwhile, AC Milan in 2007 and the current Real Madrid managed to solve the problem of losing prolific striker in the form of Andrei Shevchenko and Karim Benzema respectively, without finding a direct replacement. Carlo Ancelotti, who guided both teams, used a fine tactical tuning, each time heavily relying on the experience and winning mentality of the squad. In the case of AC Milan, he moved Kaká to the role of second striker, which wasn't entirely new for the Brazilian though, giving him a license to create. The midfield, the team's long-term trump card with the addition of the combative Massimo Ambrosini, became even more robust and gave Kaká more freedom to fully express himself. Ancelotti also visibly refreshed flanks by putting Massimo Odda and Marek Jankulovski there, and this proved to be the winning formula. Steering Real Madrid with campaign, the Italian acted differently. Although Jose Lu took upon himself a part of goal-scoring bulk, in the crucial games, the Spanish club played without a legitimate striker. Rodrigo and Vinicius interchangeably assumed this role, regularly and deliberately leaving and generating room for the trademark runs of Jude Bellingham, multiplying on the nifty and sophisticated passing and crafty attacking build-up, this tactic proved to be a real deal. However, over the course of the last decades, we have seen the examples of much more radical changes and transformations, dramatically and absolutely unexpectedly losing Marco Van Basten through a devastating injury in 1993, Fabio Capella, who was in charge of AC Milan, rapidly moved from conventional football to the pure Italian one and won the Champions League. His colleague and counterpart Marcello Lippi made the play of Juventus much more intense and mobile even before the well-documented departure of Roberto Baggio in 1995, when the Italian was sidelined for a good half of the 1994-1995 campaign and conquered Serie A and Europe largely courtesy to it. Selling Michael Owen to Real Madrid in 2004, Liverpool also drastically changed its face. Initially being unable to replace the Englishman scoring-wise, Milan Barash and Gibril Cisse gave the club much better work rate and ability to press, which was very much welcomed by the prudent and defensively orientated Rafael Benitez. Of course, all this doesn't mean that the loss of a key footballer is necessarily a good thing. History knows a plenty of examples of an opposite kind. Real Madrid in 2018 didn't manage to cover the loss of Cristiano Ronaldo a sec, whilst Barcelona proved to be helpless and hapless without Lionel Messi after his sudden exit in the summer of 2021. Barcelona also haven't been able to properly replace Luis Figu following his notorious move to Real Madrid in 2000, although we can argue that playing alongside Rivaldo who won Ballon d'Or in 1999, the Portuguese hasn't been the club's undisputed biggest star. But it would be fair to emphasize that failure in all these cases was mainly dependent on poor condition of a concrete team and largely predetermined by a better organization of the whole club. Undoubtedly, the loss of the brightest star or the franchise player, as the Americans like to call it, is an enormous stress and genuine ordeal, and that's why in the 2010s, both Barcelona and Real Madrid 
so vigorously tried to delay the moment of farewell to Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo, even when the Argentine and the Portuguese were well in their thirties. For the very same reason, it, in not so distant past, Bayern were adamant, stubbornly preventing Robin Lewandowski from his transfer to Barcelona. It worth to clarify that about a decade ago, with a meteoric emergence and constant rise of the social media, football stars transformed into commercial brands and money-earning machines outside the pitch too, which made them even more attractive for the clubs. Hence, the unwillingness to release the best ones, and it's not a coincidence that the clubs who lost their key players stopped winning the Champions League around this moment of time. The ever-growing competition contributed here as well. Therefore, the conditions are changed, but the meaning of the situation remains more or less the same. Yes, it's tough to lose your best player, but in practice it is as much a chance as an issue if the solution of the problem is in the right, safe and capable hands, of course. Those who were able to evolve and transform, being even in this unenviable position, are usually getting much stronger and hence more dangerous by virtue of sheer unpredictability. And Borussia Dortmund are a prime example here, selling Erling Holland to Manchester City in 2022, the German club performed in the Champions League and Bundesliga better than with the mighty Norwegian in their ranks. Then in 2023, Borussia parted ways with Jude Bellingham in exchange of the colossal fee for the German league and now reach the Champions League final against all odds. Let's place emphasis properly. The team hardly got stronger without the Englishman. At the same time, it would be an utter exaggeration to say that the exit of Bellingham bled it dry. The thing is that being a tremendous athlete who can contribute in many different areas simultaneously, score goals, pass relentlessly run, play well off the ball and press hard, Bellingham is exceptional in those facets of the game in which Borussia in general are extremely good either, but as a cohesive unit. Even without Drut in their ranks, the club of Edin Terzic remains one of the most mobile in Europe, especially with the regards to the Champions League as a strange as it may sound. Whereas in the supersonic Bundesliga basically each outfit is able to run about 120 km per match, in Europe this kind of strength is a relative rarity. For example, in both Lex vs PSG, a hot favorite before the semi-final, the German club conclusively outran the opponents. Accompanied by incredible luck, the Parisians six times hit the post. It has led to a genuine surprise. Indeed, the Dortmund-based club was fortunate in more ways than one. Getting into the weaker half of the draw, the black and yellow on the way to the final avoided the menacing threesome in the face of Real Madrid, Manchester City and Bayern. To this should be added that the absence of the big sharks in the shape of Liverpool, Chelsea and Juventus made the tournament's degree of competitiveness slightly less than usual. Anyway, Borussia deserves a lot of credit for their bravery and resilience, overcoming the loss of the main player through a collective effort and reinventing themselves. That's how it could be done, so it's too early to be said for those who support PSG, which enter into the next season without Kylian Mbappé. It's an enormous void, make no mistake, but with the right attitude and smart adjustments of the system of play, this issue not only could be solved, but also become springboard into a brighter future, because in football of high level often wins the one who better evolves than the one who just collects marquee name individuals.